This is the Python tutorial on how to store extracellular electrophysiology data in the NWB or Neuro Data Without Borders data standard. In this tutorial, we will create an NWB file for a hypothetical experiment recording extracellular signals from a freely moving animal. Within this NWB file, we will store the subject information such as the species, the strain or the age of the animal, the animal's position, trial information, the local field potential or LFP, and spike times. First, we will need to install PyNWB, the Python API for interacting with NWB files on your machine. Um, you can install it using pip or conda using the commands below. And you will need Python 3.5 or higher installed. First, we'll set up the NWB file. An NWB file represents a single session of experiment. Each file must have a session description, identifier, and a session start time. So in PyNWB, we will import the NWB file class from the PyNWB package, and also some date uh, classes from the date utility packages. And we'll create a se session start time variable, setting it to April 25th, 2018 at 2.30 in US Pacific time. And then we will call the constructor for NWB file and pass it these various arguments, the session description, identifier, and session start time. And then these optional fields, session ID, experimenter, the lab name, the institution name, and any publications related to the data. Um, more information about these fields and other optional fields can be found on the online documentation for PyNWB. Then we can print this NWB file uh, and see the contents within it. Here. Next, we will uh, create a subject object to store information about the experimental subject, such as the animal's age, species, genotype, sex, and a freeform description about the subject. Um, this diagram here depicts the subject class and uh, the required field subject ID, as well as optional fields uh, in gray. In PyNWB, we will import the subject class from pynwb.file, call the subject constructor, and pass it various arguments, and then set nwbfile.subject to uh, the newly constructed subject object. Many types of data can be stored in specialized classes in NWB. To store the spatial position of an animal, we will use the spatial series and position classes. Spatial series is a subclass of the time series class, and the time series class is a common base class for measurements sampled over time. It provides fields for data and time, and time can be regularly or irregularly sampled. Here's the class diagram for the time series class. You can see that it has a field for name, a field for description, a field for data, as well as a related field for the unit of measurement for the data. And then you can provide uh, the sampling rate and the starting time, or you can pro provide uh, timestamps, uh, an array of timestamps, in case the data are irregularly sampled. The spatial series class extends the time series class, which means that it basically inherits all of these fields, and it might add new ones or refine the ones in time series uh, to be more specific. So in this case, the data field is refined to be a one-dimensional array. So there's one data point uh, for every timestamp, uh, and the unit of measurement is set to meters. We also added a new field in spatial series called reference frame. This describes what a data value of zero um, refers to. So uh, to do this, to create a spatial series object in PyNWB, we'll first uh, import NumPy, and we'll import the spatial series class from pynwb.behavior. We'll create some fake data. Um, we'll create, uh, this fake data will be, uh, have shape 50 by two, um, and we'll also create some fake timestamps that are 50, have shape 50 by one. Uh, the first dimension of the data array uh, should always represent time. So it should have the same number of values as your timestamps array if you're supplying timestamps. Um, then we'll call the spatial series constructor and pass in these arguments, the name, description, the data and timestamps that we just set here, and a reference frame describing what zero means. And we'll store this in the variable called spatial series object. You can print this object to view its contents. 
Um, there are some default values that we could optionally set, uh, but in this case, um, I chose not to. You can see the data that we've set, um, the timestamps that we've set, the unit of the timestamps are kind of default to seconds, and the unit of the data are in meters. Next, to help data analysis and visualization tools, know that this spatial series object represents the position of the animal. We'll store the spatial series object inside of a position object. And if you go back to the class diagram here, um, the position object is just a container called position that uh, holds one or more different spatial series objects. Basically, it's a way to, to label or um, the spatial series object as a position um, by containing one inside the other. We'll create uh, this position object by first importing the position class from pynwb.behavior and then uh, calling the constructor, passing our spatial series object in um, as an argument. Now, NWB differentiates between raw acquired data, which should never change, and processed data, which are the results of pre-processing algorithms and could change. Uh, let's say you change some parameters or you have different pre-processing algorithms. Those would all um, count as processed data. Um, let's assume that the animal's position was computed from a video tracking algorithm, so it will be classified as process data. And since process data can be very diverse, NWB allows us to create processing modules, which are kind of like folders, to store related process data or, uh, together or to store um, data that comes from a single algorithm all in one place. So we'll create a processing module for storing all behavioral data in the NWB file. We'll call it behavior, and we'll add the position object to that module uh, as follows. We'll call the create processing module um, method, pass in name equals behavior, give it a description, and then uh, we can add the position object to the behavioral module. I forgot to run these cells, so I'll do that now. And then you can see here the contents of the behavioral module that we just created. It has a position object with the field spatial series uh, set to a spatial series object that we created earlier. Now let's write the file that we just uh, built to disk. To do that, we'll import the class um, NWB HDF5IO. I know that's a mouthful, but it's basically taking an NWB file um, and writing it to disk using the HDF5 backend. Uh, and we can use this class for reading and writing. So here we'll use it for writing. Pass it the file name, ECFS tutorial, the NWB, and the mode for the IO object. In this case, it's we want to write, so we're going to use the write mode or W. Um, and then we call io.write and pass the nwb file object. We can then read the file and print it to inspect its contents. We can also print the spatial series data that we created by referencing the names of the objects in the hierarchy that contain it. Um, and I'll demonstrate that here. Uh, we can use the same io object to uh, open the file and read it. So in this, this time we're going to use the mode r for read. We'll call io.read, and we get back an NWB file object, um, just like the one that we created, and we'll store it in red NWB file. Um, and now we can navigate through the red NWB file, um, find the processing module called behavior, find the position object within it that's called position, find the spatial series object that we created and put inside it that's named spatial series, and print out the spatial series. And we can see the same spatial series that we uh, put into the NWB file earlier, except here the data and the timestamps fields are HDF5 data sets. Um, when you read an NWB file uh, from disk, these fields, uh, data and timestamps and several other fields within the file, could get very big. And so we read the data lazily, as in, which means that we don't actually access the data unless you um, call dot data uh, specifically to load the data in. This makes sure that when you read the file uh, at first pass, it doesn't take minutes to hours in case your file is gigabytes large.
We can also use the HDF view, view tool, which you can find online from the HDF5 website, to inspect the resulting NWB file. So when you load it up, here's that file we just created. Uh, you can navigate through um, kind of the, the internals of the file, go through processing, uh, find the behavioral module, find the position object, find the spatial series object within that, and then you'll see several fields such as for data and timestamps, um, several attributes, and you can uh, open up the data and explore it here. Next, I'll show you how to store trial information within an NWB file. Trials are stored in a time intervals object, which is a subclass of dynamic table. Dynamic table objects are used to store tabular or table metadata uh, throughout NWB. And you'll see it pop up for storage of trial information, electrode information, uh, sorted units, and more. Um, these dynamic tables are nice because they allow um, NWB to specify required columns for the, for the table, as well as optional columns and allow uh, end users and researchers to uh, specify custom columns um, because it's really hard for uh, standards like NWB to know exactly what kind of trial information should be standardized across every experiment out there. So we can see the dynamic table has a name, a description, and uh, one required column, just the ID, which is uh, an int, a unique int, one for each row. Um, and the time intervals table uh, extends the dynamic table object and specifies a start time and a stop time for each row. And the trials table is just a specific instantiation of the time intervals trial that has the name trials. So we can add um, to our NWB file some trial information. We can add a custom column using the add trial column method here. Um, give it a name, let's say correct, and a description saying whether the trial was correct or not. And then now we can use the add trial method to um, add rows to our trials table. Uh, and start time and stop time are required fields for trials, and as well as any columns that um, that you have added, such as co the correct uh, column here. So here we're adding a, start, uh, a trial where it started at one second, uh, ended at five seconds, and was marked true, uh, correct. And then we can add a second trial and so on. Now let's add electrode information to the NWB file. El extracellular electrodes are stored in, in an electrodes table, which is also a dynamic table. The electrodes table has several required fields, uh, X, Y, Z, impedance, the location of the electrode, uh, any filtering information about the electrode, and the electrode group. And I'll describe the electrode group in just a second. Uh, but first here, you can see the electrodes table as an instance, specific instance of, an, of a dynamic table with these required um, fields and a particular name. Um, Again, we can use uh, a similar method as add trial column. We can use add electrode column um, to add a new electrode column to uh, a new column to this electrodes table called label. And this will just be um, just to have the, a description of the electrode. Uh, we'll use this code here to add electrodes for a multi shank probe with four shanks. Each shank has three electrodes. Um, so we'll go through this loop, and for each shank, we're going to create an electrode group. Now, electrode groups are just what the name says. It's a grouping of electrodes. Uh, this is useful for marking that uh, a set of electrodes belong to a single shank. It can also be useful for um, labeling electrodes as part of uh, the same tetrode configuration or this uh, use which can be useful for spike sorting, or it can be uh, used to mark which uh, electrodes are active or which electrodes are bad, etc. They just have a name, a description, a location, and a device. And um, importantly, the device uh, will refer to or should refer to um, 
the a device object that you create for the probe itself. And that would have a name and can have a description and a manufacturer. Um, so here we first create a device and we call it array. And then we add it, we create an electrode group on the NWB file object. We give it a name, a description, pass the same device, um, and give it a location. And then we add electrodes associated with this electrode group to the electrodes table. And we do that by passing X, Y, Z, and impedance, location, uh, filtering information, um, the group that we uh, created earlier, and a label, um, which is just a simple label of which shank and which electrode this is. Um, and this is the custom column that we created earlier up here. And we do this for all 12 electrodes across the four shanks. Next, I'll describe how we store voltage data, such as uh, the local field potential. So voltage data are stored in electrical series objects. And electrical series is a subclass of time series specialized for voltage data. In order to create this, uh, our electrical series object for our LFP data, we will need to reference a set of rows in the electrodes table that, to indicate which electrodes were recorded from. And we'll do this by creating a dynamic table region which is a type of link that allows you to reference specific rows of a dynamic table, such as the electrodes table, by row indices. So let's say you did a recording, um, and you did a recording of just uh, electrode number one and electrode number three um, for your LFP. So then you can create a dynamic table region that just references electrodes one and three, and not all the other electrodes. In this case, uh, for this demonstration, we'll create a dynamic table region that references all rows of the electrode table. Do this here by calling uh, create electrode table region, uh, that method on the NWB file object. Pass it uh, a list of indices into, as a, the region argument. So up here we counted the number of electrodes, it should be at 12. So this will say region equals a list 1 to 12, which indicates all the electrodes. And now we'll create an electrical series object to hold the LFP data collected during the experiment. Um, the electrical series class is a subclass of time series, so it has all of these fields, plus uh, the data field is refined to be uh, a two-dimensional array, um, time by channels, um, or time by electrodes, and the unit of measurement is fixed to be volts. And in addition, it has the required field electrodes, which is a dynamic table region into the electrodes table, um, indicating which rows of the electrodes table or which electrodes were recorded from. Um, so uh, to do this in PyNWB, we will import the electrical series class from PyNWB.ECEFIS. We'll create some fake data here, and we'll call the constructor for electrical series, pass it the name, data, um, the electrodes, uh, the dynamic table region has the electrodes. And uh, in this case, uh, we'll use a sampling rate of 200. By default, the starting time is zero seconds. All right, to help data analysis and visualization tools know that this electrical series object represents LFP data and not some other voltage data, we will store the electrical series object inside of an LFP object or LFP container. And then we'll place this LFP object in a processing module named ECE Phys or Extracellular Electrophysiology. This is analogous to how we stored the spatial series object inside of a position object earlier, uh, and we stored the position object inside a processing module named behavior. So this is kind of the, the full chart diagram here. Um, we had our electrodes table uh, that references an electrodes group which referenced a device for the probe. We have our electrical series, um, which references rows of the electrodes table. And then we have our LFP object, which contains uh, an electrical series or more than one, if there are more than one. And we put all of this with, within a processing module called ECE Phys. Okay. So we import the LFP class, call it its constructor. We create a processing module called ECE Phys and we add um, LFP, the LFP object to the ECE Phys module. Next, we'll add spike times to the NWB file. 
Spike times are stored in the units table, which is another subclass of dynamic table. Uh, just like for the electrodes table and the trials table, we can add custom columns to the units table um, to specify any special user-defined uh, information associated with each unit. So here we'll generate some random spike data and populate the units table using the add unit method on NWB file. Uh, first, we'll add a unit column called quality uh, to capture the sorting quality of each unit. And then we will run through this for loop um, in range 1 to n to add 10 units with random spike times. Then we will write the file using the code that we've used previously, um, calling with nwb hdf5io the file name and w for write mode, and calling io.writes on the nwb file object. Data arrays are read passively from the file. Uh, this means that the data is not loaded into memory until you explicitly uh, tell pi nwb to load it. So calling time series.data does not read the data values. It presents an h5pi object that can be indexed to read the data. You would index this array just like a numpy array to read only a section of the array. Or you can use the colon, uh, the square brackets with a colon inside it operator to read the entire thing. So that's what we'll do in this example here. We'll create an, uh, an IO object just like before, read it into uh, and, and create an NWB file object here. Navigate the file to uh, through the ECE Fizz processing module into the LFP object inside of that, into the electrical series that we named electrical series within that, and then we're going to print all of the data. There it is. So it's often preferable to read only a portion of the data. So to do this, we'll index or slice into the data property uh, using this syntax here. The following, uh, this code will print elements 0 to 10 in the first dimension and 0 to 3 in the second dimension from the LFP data. Um, accessing data from a dynamic table is similar. You basically uh, say red nwb file dot units, um, and then within the first bracket, you pass the name of the column. Uh, which in this case is spike times, and then in the second brackets, um, you, index, you indicate which rows uh, you want to print out. So this example will print the spike times from the zeroth units. To learn more about NWB and how to use the Python API, PyNWB, or the MATLAB API, MATNWB, to read and write NWB files, uh, please go to nwb.org or check out this notebook and click the links within the notebook um, for more information. Thanks for listening.